Today we will start with a new topic uh, which is electrokinetics. So, uh, in some of our previous lectures, we made a passing remark that uh, in uh, microfluidics flow can be controlled by electrical fields and uh, the science behind that mainly lies on electrokinetics which is basically a combination of electrostatics and hydrodynamics. So, uh, with uh, the reasonable introduction on hydrodynamics that you have, uh, we will start with some basic issues in electrochemistry, thermodynamics and electrostatics that will lay the foundation of electrokinetics. So, uh, what is electrokinetics? Uh, it is uh, very, it is not a very uh, stringent definition, but uh, in one of the very uh, famous books uh, authored by Hunter who is uh, a well known scientist in this area, uh, in the book Foundations of Colloid Science, uh, he has referred electrokinetics to all the processes in which the boundary layer between one charged phase and another is forced to undergo some sort of shearing process. The charge attached to one phase will move in one direction and that associated with the adjoining phase will move more or less tangentially in the opposite direction. This is just a qualitative remark, but uh, frankly speaking this uh, does not give too much of information of what is electrokinetics all about. So, we will start with uh, some of the basic issues. Now, one of the important considerations of electrokinetics is the formation of a charge layer close to the <coughs> fluid solid interface. So, uh, the question is uh, first that what is this charge layer? So, think of a micro channel. So, if you have a micro channel made of a material like glass say for example. So, we expect that there will be some surface charge and there will be a layer of fluid which is close to the solid in which there will be some kind of net charge. So, the question is that uh, how will this charge layer be formed and uh, what are the typical dimensions of this charge layer and uh, uh, like what, uh, what are the details of the charge layer that are formed. So, this charge layer which is called as electrical double layer, some of the important terminologies associated with that are as follows. Most solid surfaces tend to acquire a net surface charge may be positive or negative when brought in contact with an aqueous solvent. Various surface charging mechanisms are there like ionization of covalently bonded surface groups, ion adsorption, this is totally chemistry basically. So, we will not get into the details of that, uh, but we will use that in the context of fluid mechanics uh, for the purpose of modulating flow through micro channels and nano channels. Now, aqueous solutions generally have dissolved ions, there are some terminologies so, if the surface has a negative charge, then in the fluid, if you have positive charge ions, those are called as counter ions. Counter ions means ions charged opposite to the surface charge. So, if the surface charge is negative, then positive ions in the fluid is counter ion. If surface charge is positive, then negative charge in the fluid is counter ion. So, counter means opposite sign and co ion means ions having the same polarity as that of the surface charge very straightforward terminologies. Charge surface attracts counter ions, it is obvious because of Coulombic attraction, charge surface will attract counter ions and they will repel co ions. Now, as I told you that uh, uh, it is the chemistry that decides that there will be a net surface charge 
and uh, there are several mechanisms. I will not get into the details of the mechanisms, but some of the mechanisms are highlighted here like ionization of surface groups. So, magnitude of the surface charge depends on the acidic or basic strengths of the surface groups and on the pH of the solution. Uh, charge crystal surfaces may be there or isomorphic substitution may be possible, specific ion adsorption may be possible. So, these are some of the basic chemical features or chemistry based uh, phenomena that in turn dictate that it is possible that there will be a net surface charge. Question is in microfluidics we do not so much bother about what is the mechanism by which this surface charge is formed, but we are more bothered in how we can exploit this surface charge to control or manipulate the fluid flow. Now, <coughs> There are some more issues about the electrical double layer. <coughs> so, uh, I will uh, try to give you a qualitative picture that uh, what we are bothered about. Let us say we have a surface like this. Let us say this is a glass surface. I am talking about a single surface if there are multiple walls same phenomenon will happen at all the walls. So, this surface has say because of some ion adsorption this surface has acquired some negative charge. Now, in the remaining the, the entire system being electrically neutral one would expect that all the positive charge whatever it is will fall on the surface so that it will neutralize, but neutralization will not happen just like that because all the ions would have fallen on this surface provided the ions had no thermal energy, but ions because of their temperature have their own thermal energy. So, that will resist all the ions from falling on the top of this. So, there will be some fixed layer of ions. some fixed positive charges which will be bound to the surface, but there. So, this will not totally neutralize this and there will be some in the outer layer which is not I will tell you the names of these layers the technical names, but I am just trying to give you a qualitative picture. So, there will be some positive ions as well as some negative ions. There will be some uh, okay, draw the negative ions by green color. So, there will be some negative ions in the bulk, but there will be some positive ions in the bulk and those will dominate I mean I have not drawn it in the proper way actually because there will be a distribution it is not that it will be stacked like this. But what I want to convey is the important thing that this bulk plus subsurface in totality will neutralize the system. So, in the surface there will be some charge on the surface there will be some charge uh, some uh, immobile ions, these ions are sort of immobilized because they are uh, strongly bound to the surface, but in the bulk there are some additional positive ions, there are some negative ions, but positive ions surplus the negative ions because you know eventually because the surface had acquired a net negative charge. the fluid should have a net positive charge, so that the system is electrically neutral. So, the question is that uh, like how far this distribution of ions is there that means, how far from the wall you see the effect of this charge layer. Uh, we will try to answer this question first qualitatively and then more and more quantitatively. 
then what are the names of these different layers so uh, uh, we will uh, discuss about that uh, through the slide which is uh, there displayed so we will uh, refer to the slides so uh, now if ions had no thermal motion all the counter ions would have stacked against the surface right but uh, that is a hypothetical picture in reality ions have non zero absolute temperature so they have thermal motion so there is a balance between coulombic attraction and thermal interaction so by coulombic attraction what will happen all the positive ions will tend to fall on the negative surface but because of thermal in, uh, energy what will happen is that ions will uh, try to escape from that attraction and will try to remain in the bulk so there will be a balance at equilibrium there will be a equilibrium distribution of ions in the fluid so uh, there is a charge distribution that prevails adjacent to the surface so you have a charge surface and an ion distribution so basically you are considering two layers one is a charge surface layer and another is the uh, ion uh, distributed ion distributed fluid layer and these two together we call it electrical double layer so there are various theories of electrical double layer uh, so uh, and these theories can be from as simple to uh, more and more uh, complex form so we will uh, discuss about a very simple model which is called as gau chapman model with stern modification so uh, to give you a qualitative picture and this is a very important qualitative picture you see that uh, uh, like if you assume the surface to be of negative charge like very commonly we give an example of negative charge because with uh, neutral water ph glass surface will develop negative charge so that is a very common example practical example that is why but do not keep any prejudice in mind that it has to be negative charge it can be negative positive anything depends on the ph of the solution so even it can be zero charge if the ph of the solution corresponds to point of zero charge so it it can it can be anything now uh, if you see that uh, uh, there are if the surface has uh, has a negative charge then positive charge one layer of positive charge ions gets stacked against the surface okay so this layer doesn't move and this layer is called as stern layer the name of this layer is called a stern layer or helmholtz layer stern layer or helmholtz layer this layer is few angstroms in thickness and uh, the reason is quite obvious that this the, the few angstroms is like basically represents uh, one uh, entity of ions their the ionic diameter beyond the stern layer you will see that ions are mobile in the stern layer the ions are not mobile but i mean uh, advanced research shows that in the stern layer ions are not mobile provided there is no hydrophobic interaction if there is hydrophobic interaction then you may even immobilize the stern layer but i will not try to confuse you with those research issues so uh, under circumstances when uh, this uh, uh, the wall is hydrophilic then you have the stern layer that is immob uh, immobile so you can see there is a uh, layer which is called as diffuse layer shown in the diagram where you have uh, both positive and negative ions as i mentioned in the schematic also that i drew in the board uh, there are both positive and negative ions and those ions are mobile that means if you can apply a field then you can make the field may be whatever electric field whatever field you can make ions in this layer move okay so one strategy of 
actuating fluid flow could be that in the diffuse layer whatever are the ions if you now apply electric field if these ions move then because of viscous interaction between the ions and the polar water molecules the water molecules will also start moving and this is the process called as electroosmosis so we will discuss about this in details but this is just to give you a picture that why are we studying this there must be a motivation for which we are going through the description of the electrical double layer so this diffuse layer is also known as the gau chapman layer so there are various names uh, so you can see that there is an interface between the diffuse layer and the stern layer there is an interface between the diffuse layer and the stern layer and this that interface is given by this dotted line whatever dotted line is there okay this dotted line whatever uh, this cursor is indicating this dotted line is the interface uh, between the two layers and this interface is called as shear plane and the potential so if you now see the potential distribution across if the transverse direction of the solid boundary is y then you can see that how the potential varies with y so uh, you you have a potential drop across the stern layer and then you will have the there is a potential drop and you come to a location where you find that the potential has almost asymptotically reach, reached to zero so uh, that potential which has asymptotically reached to zero is called as uh, uh, i mean the distance up to which you go uh, to reach the potential uh, approximately equal to 0 is the span of the electrical double layer. So, the elect so electrical double layer is a sort of analogous to boundary layer just like outside boundary layer you do not feel the effect of the, vi the viscous interaction between the wall and the fluid similarly outside the electrical double layer you do not feel the effect of surface charging. Now the electrical double layer has a characteristic length scale which is called as lambda. Now this is not the thickness of the electrical double layer. You can see that actually the electrical double layer spans uh, somewhat beyond that but this is a characteristic length scale that denotes the length scale of the electrical double layer and that is called as Debye length. So these are very important uh, terminology. Sometimes Debye length is confused as thickness of the electrical double layer that is not correct it is just a length scale characterizing the electrical double layer it is not exactly the thickness of the electrical double layer and these are some of the misunderstandings or misconceptions that must be clarified the other concept is that in electrochemistry there is a very important terminology called as zeta potential so the zeta potential what is zeta potential zeta potential is the electrical potential at the shear plane this dotted line at this dotted line whatever is the potential that is called as zeta potential. So the shear plane is a very important location because in, in case of a hydrophilic surface you can see that anything to the, to the left of the shear plane in this diagram anything to the left is immobile. So the shear plane effectively acts like a plane on which you apply the no slip boundary condition not on the wall. Hey, because anything left of the shear plane is actually immobile in this case but when it is mobile when you make the stern layer mobile then that consideration is not true so these are subtle things that you have to keep in mind now with the electrical double layer formation associated may be uh, several electrokinetic effects there are four primary electrokinetic effects which are considered in the literature what are these electroosmosis it refers to the relative movement of liquid over a stationary charged surface with an external electric field acting as an actuator uh, streaming potential it refers to the electrical potential that is induced when a liquid containing ions is driven to flow along a stationary charged surface so uh, 
uh, it is uh, like sort of inverse of electroosmosis. Electrophoresis it refers to the movement of a charged surface relative to a stationary liquid due to the application of an external electric field and sedimentation potential it refers to the potential that is induced when a charged particle moves relative to a stationary liquid. So, interestingly electroosmosis or electrophores electrophoresis it depends on the reference frame from which you are looking into it. So, electroosmosis will refer to movement of liquid relative to a solid boundary. So, the solid boundary is stationary, but the liquid is moving and electrophoresis refers to movement of a charged particle relative to a liquid that means as if the liquid is stationary and the charged particle is moving both are subject to electric field. So, in that sense electroosmosis and electrophoresis are related and streaming potential and sedimentation potential are related. Out of all these phenomena we are going to study electroosmosis in some details, streaming potential in some details and some aspects of electrophoresis in this particular course. Of course, we will also study some other uh, electrokinetic phenomena, but in significantly less details as compared to this. Now, every study in science requires a background. So, we will uh, study uh, the uh, electrical double layer phenomenon with a suitable background that requires some considerations in thermodynamics. Why we require the considerations in thermodynamics? The reason is straightforward that uh, like if you have a system of uh, different chemical entities, the system is in equilibrium, chemical equilibrium when there is no gradient in chemical potential because chemical potential is the driving force for a chemical change to take place that is called as chemical potential. So, if there is chemical potential gradient then that will create a driving force and that will create a change. So, equilibrium picture with chemical entities should have uh, like no gradient of chemical potential. However, in our system it is not merely chemical entities. In our system you have ions which are chemical entities, but with charge. So, we have to augment the chemical potential with electrical effects and that is called as electrochemical potential. So, we have to first establish an expression for the electrochemical potential within the electrical double layer and for that we have to first refer to the chemical potential and there we have to refer to the thermodynamic issues. So, to understand the thermodynamic issues uh, we will uh, go to the board and try to discuss about this. So, we will start with uh, because I mean different uh, students in the class may have different backgrounds in thermodynamics I am not quite familiar with what kinds of backgrounds all of you have. So, I will start with something which is very basic. So, I will start with the first law of thermodynamics. So, uh, let us say that we are having a system with some heat transfer delta Q and with some work delta W. So, the first law for the system tells that delta Q is equal to d E plus delta W, where this E includes internal energy plus kinetic energy plus potential energy. Okay. Very often in thermodynamic processes the change in internal energy is much more important as compared to changes in kinetic and potential energy and then that will approximate to d U. Okay. So, importantly it is not the kinetic energy and potential energy that is small, 
but changes in kinetic energy and potential energy are small. So, many times I mean this is from my experience I have asked students to write what are the assumptions behind this equation and they will straight away write neglecting kinetic energy and potential energy. I mean that is not a correct thing because kinetic energy and potential energy may be very important in many processes their changes may, may not be important because it is the D of that what is what is of our concern. Now, let us write, let us assume that the system is a simple compressible substance undergoing a quasi equilibrium process or a quasi static process. So, if the system is, is a simple compressible substance means the changes in pressure volume temperature are much more significant as compared to other effects like electrical effect, magnetic effect and so on. So, for such a case if it is a quasi equilibrium process we can write this as P d V. So, again the restriction is important simple compressible substance undergoing a quasi equilibrium process. So, you can write this as P d V. Okay. Uh, now, this quasi equilibrium process is also one type of internally reversible process. So, a process is reversible when once having taken place it can be reversed, but in doing so it leaves no change in the system and in the surroundings. So, when the system comes back to its original state there is no net change in the surroundings also. So, if you do that then uh, this kind of a process, so you can realize this process by a very slow expansion of a gas in a piston cylinder arrangement and that, that makes sure that internally it is a reversible process, but external reversibility ex, rather external irreversibility cannot be precluded. The reason is there could be a finite temperature difference between the system and the surrounding across which the heat transfer can take place that will make it externally irreversible. Now, a system is a process is reversible if it is both externally and internally reversible. Then for a reversible process you can make an additional modification in this that you can write in place of del Q T d s this is for a reversible process. Now, you can get away with the internal uh, external irreversibility if you choose a proper temperature so that your system considers the only, only the system it neglects the surrounding and you are talking about the system boundary temperature. But we will not get into that complication there are several processes like uh, which are only internally reversible, but externally reversible. I mean, uh, there are some terminologies associated called as endo reversible processes, but I will not get into such a complication. So, I mean, we will simply say that if it is a reversible process, del Q is T d s. Now, what is this T? So, typically temperature of the system boundary across which the heat transfer is taking place. Now, uh, uh, if you write now, uh, so uh, these are like the extensive properties we can divide by the mass and write T d s is equal to d u plus P d v right. Now, although for deriving this equation we have used various assumptions once this equation is derived it can be used to calculate the change in entropy for any process. The question is why? Because for deriving it we have used several assumptions now we are claiming that it can be used for any process. So, why, why, why it should be like that? See the reason is as follows let us say there is a system in any plane P v plane, T s plane whatever we draw the system. Uh, changing state between 1 to 2. Okay. So, there is an irreversible path 
which is this. Typically irreversible processes in thermodynamic planes we draw by dotted lines because we do not know exactly what are the intermediate thermodynamic states. Now we construct a hypothetical reversible process between 1 to 2, say this is a reversible path. So over that hypothetical reversible path we can integrate this equation. But once it is integrated, it will give you S2 minus S1 because S is a point function that will not depend on whether we have gone by this dotted path or this continuous path. That is the spirit by which we say that it is valid for any process. So the integration has to be carried over a reversible path. But once the integration has been evaluated, that change in entropy can be used to evaluate the change in entropy for any process that connects the two end state points. Okay. So uh, with this little bit of a background, now we can write the alternative forms of this and uh, because of its universal nature, this kind of uh, thermodynamic relationship is very important and uh, in place of U, you can write H minus PV. Right? by using the definition of enthalpy which is H. So this is dH minus PdV minus Vdp plus PdV. So Tds is equal to dH minus <coughs> Vdp that is another way of writing the same thing in terms of enthalpy rather than internal energy. Now when we are thinking of chemical potential, we are interested with two other important functions, the Gibbs function or the Gibbs free energy or the Helmholtz function or the Helmholtz free energy. So as an example, we will talk about the Gibbs function or the Gibbs free energy and the chemical potential associated with that, with that. So what is G? That is H minus Ts. Okay. So G is defined as H minus Ts. So th this is called as free energy. That is uh, so called an energy that is freely available for a chemical change to take place. So d, you can write dg is equal to dh minus tds minus sdt. dh minus tds is what? Vdp, right? From this equation, dh minus tds is equal to Vdp. So this is Vdp minus Sdt. Now the chemical potential of a pure component, chemical potential of a pure component A pure substance. This is defined as mu is equal to G bar, bar at the top when I use it means molar quantity per mole that is and capital is the extensive property. So G by the number of moles. So this equation is written on a mass basis but you can easily write it on a molar basis. So for a molar basis just write in terms of per unit mole in terms instead of per unit mass. Okay. So just convert from mass basis to mole basis, all, quanti all parameters will be changed equivalently. So you can write dg 
at constant t which is equal to what? This is equal to V dp because at constant t dt is equal to 0. Okay. Now let us take an example of an ideal gas. So, if you take the example of an ideal gas, then you can write V is equal to R T by P. This R bar is the universal gas constant that is that 8.314. Okay. So, uh, R bar T by P. So, this d g bar, this is d mu because g bar is mu. d mu at constant temperature is equal to r t because t is constant it is like d p by p is d of ln p, right. So, for an ideal gas, we can express the chemical potential of the pure substance exclusively in terms of pressure. And typically, the ideal gas quantities we denote by star. So, just I am writing d mu star, star will mean because every time I will not write in words ideal gas. Whenever I write star, you must understand it is ideal gas. Whenever I give bar at the top, you must understand that it is molar quantity. Okay. So, now the question is that this is true for an ideal gas, but what is uh, the what is the same thing if it is not an ideal gas or what is the similar type of expression when it is not an ideal gas. So, just for mathematical convenience for a substance which is not ideal gas, we cannot write d mu is equal to r t d l and p, right. So, what do we write? Instead of using the pressure as a quantity, we use a different quantity which is a pseudo pressure. That means, it becomes pressure only when the state of the substance corresponds to an ideal gas state. Otherwise, it is not pressure and that pressure like quantity or pseudo pressure is known as fugacity. So, it is called, uh, so you for any general substance, you can write d mu is equal to r t d l n f, this f is called as fugacity. So, it is like pseudo pressure. But when does fugacity become pressure? When it becomes an ideal gas. At what pressure it becomes an ideal gas? Technically, a real gas becomes ideal gas at what pressure? Low or high? Very low pressure. So, when you consider the limit as p tends to 0, f by p that tends to 1 because fugacity tends to pressure as p tends to 0. So, the complete definition with fugacity is that in the asymptotic limit when you tend to ideal gas behavior, the fugacity should tend to pressure. Okay. Now, so this is about a single component, but single component is just to give you an idea of the basic definitions we are interested about not a single component system, but a multi component system. So, how do we characterize a multi component system?
Now, for a multi component system, let us say that we have an extensive property, always extensive properties we write by uppercase alphabets. So, let us say that capital X is an extensive property. Capital X is a function of, let us say there are two components A and B, just for simplicity that in the mixture there are two components A and B. So, capital X is a function of T P, see this is the difference between the pure substance thermodynamics that you have learnt in undergraduate curriculum and you have the now the concept of a multi component system. The property of a pure substance will not depend on the composition of the individual constituents, but when you have the multi component system it will in addition to the thermodynamic states it will also depend on the composition. N A and N B are the number of moles of A and B. Okay. So, you can write d x at t and p at fixed t and p identically there would have been no change in property if it would have been a pure substance with t and p as independent thermodynamic properties. But now there will be a change because of the change related to the composition. So, first let us write d x not at fixed T p because it will give you a clear idea where from we are getting the expression. So, you can write So, this is just mathematics rule of partial derivatives. The total derivative is sum total of all the, the total differential is sum total of all the partial differentials. Okay. Now, for the pure substance, these were the terms, right? Fixed Na and B. Okay. So, just like d g is equal to minus s d t plus v d p, you can cast that in this form, right. But you are now having some extra terms here. So, what are the extra terms? The extra terms, so you can if you write d x at t and p constant t and p the extra terms will be important because at constant t and p these terms will be 0. So, this term then we will use a color to represent it. This term del x del n a at t p n b this is called as partial molal property a partial molal property. And remember partial molal property only refers to extensive property, it does not refer to any intensive property. So, what this is the change in extensive property x per unit change in the number of moles of the component A that is the partial molar property for A. Keeping what fixed? Temperature 
pressure and number of moles of B fixed. So, if in place of B there are uh, in addition to B there are C, D, E, F many other components that means you are keeping T, P and all other NJs other than the component I that is only the component I which is A for this case get change in number of moles and uh, all other number of moles are fixed. Okay. Now, this being a property, this is a property, so it should depend on composition, any property will depend on composition. So, when you are allowing the change in number of moles of A, that will change the composition. So, technically how can it be a property when you are allowing it a change in composition to take place. So, to resolve this, basically we are assuming that an infinitesimal number of moles of A is either added or taken away. So, the change in number of moles is infinitesimal, practically it is not infinitesimal, but practically considering the number of total number of moles which are present in the system, the actual change in number of moles may be very insignificant as compared to that. So, that practically it does not change the composition of the system. <coughs> so, you can write this as Okay. So, now if you integrate this, so you can write x at T p is equal to x bar a n a plus x bar b n b. Okay. With the integration, the assumption is that these partial molar properties are constant. These do not do not change with the change in the number of moles. Okay. And the assumption that I have told that it is actually the number of moles, the change is insignificant as compared to the total number of moles that you are handling in the system. Okay. So, the partial molar property is very important. So, you can write in place of capital X if you write the G at T p. So, you can write G bar A n A plus G bar B n B. What is this G? This is the Gibbs function or the Gibbs free energy. This is the partial molar Gibbs function for the component A in the mixture. Okay partial molar Gibbs function for the component A in the mixture and this is alternatively given by the symbol mu A. So, you can see the analogy between the pure component and the mixture. So, with this definition now just like that for the pure component we define something which is a pseudo pressure or a pressure like quantity which is fugacity of a pure component. Now, for a mixture we should define something which is fugacity of the component in the mixture. So, that we will do in the next slide. So, fugacity of a component in a mixture. So, consider a component I in the mixture. So, for that mu i, so i is like the component A, mu i is equal to g i bar is equal to del g del n i at t p n j, j not equal to i. So, you can write this as d mu i is equal to r t d l n f bar i, okay. that, a, that f bar i which is this one f bar i, this is fugacity of component i in a mixture, that is how we you write it. Now, look at the limit definition, with the limit as what? When, when you are considering an ideal gas state, what will be the fugacity? Fugacity of a component in the mixture 
will become now the partial pressure of the ideal gas that is there. So, when you have a mixture of ideal gases, you use the concept of partial pressure that is the pressure that it would have exerted had would have had it occupied the entire volume of the mixture. So, now the what is the partial pressure of an ideal gas that is the total pressure times the mole fraction. So, you can write that limit as p tends to 0 f i bar by y i is the mole fraction of i, y i is the mole fraction of i. So, the mole fraction of i into pressure ok. So, uh, the difference between the pure component and then and the mixture for an ideal gas is for a pure component you have the pressure as it is for an ideal gas the pressure is uh, for a mixture the for an ideal gas the pressure is replaced by partial pressure which is the total pressure times the mole fraction that is the change in basic paradigm. Now, uh, we will define or we will try to find out what is the change in volume when you mix that is a very important concept that we will discuss. So, when you mix say two chemical entities, these entities may be ions or whatever, when you mix from their individual constituent state to a mixture state, there are changes in various properties and one of the very important properties is volume. So, we will try to figure out that what is the change in volume as you mix. So, to do that, So, let us write this G as a function of T P n A n B. In the slides I have generalized by n number of components and used in index i for the ith component and j for any other component, but I think that it will you will find the derivation easy to follow if I just use two components and then you can generalize it for n number of components that is why in the board I am working with only two components. So, d g is equal to Now, let us consider d g at fixed t and n b ok, d g at fixed t and n b at fixed t and n b d t will be 0 and d n b will be 0. So, this will become del g del p Can you tell what is this? Very easily you can tell, I will tell you that how you can quickly tell this. These are the multi component terms, forget about this. 
So, the pure substance terms are these two. So, try to see an analogy between dg is equal to minus SDT plus BDP, right. So, this is basically minus S and this is B. So, this will be equal to V. And what is this? This is partial molal Gibbs function of the component A or equivalently the chemical potential of A. Now, in thermodynamics if you have or, or just in, in differential calculus if you have dz is equal to m dx plus n dy, then this m is basically del z del x and this is del z del y. So, for continuity you must have del m del y is equal to del n del x for the continuity in the second order partial derivative. So, take m is equal to this and n is equal to this. So, you can write del m del y del v del n a at t p n b is equal to del n del x del mu a or del g a bar whatever you write right which one p n a n b yes not p right right so what is this by the definition of partial molar property this is partial molar volume so v a is equal to del G A del P at T N A N B. We can write the same thing for the pure component. For the pure component, in place of partial molar property it will be molar property molar property so v a with a bar at the top is equal to del g a del p at constant t constant t n a n b of course because uh, for the for the pure component n a n b are anyway fixed okay now, what is the change in volume due to mixing? What is volume before mixing? What is V before? What is volume before mixing? N A V A plus N B V B individual sum of the volumes. What is the volume after mixing? N A partial molar volume plus N B partial molar volume right this is the mixture property so the change in volume due to mixing is the difference between these two so you essentially required to calculate the difference between capital v a bar and small v a bar and that we will take up in the next lecture thank you